Okay, YouTube stream is working. We can start. Um, Ranku, your microphone is muted. Thank you very much, Florian, for uh, pointing that out. I was thanking you for your able um, technical help so far and uh, indeed for uh, reminding me of that. So welcome everybody to, to this, um, I believe, last uh, session of um, iCalp Track B. Um, we have six very nice papers in this session. Um, and uh, Florian is our technical person. Um, Anuj is here um, as the reserve chair. And we also have, um, have David Purser um, who, um, who is the moderator. So once again, welcome everybody. Our first paper is um, the paper entitled Finite Sequentiality of Finitely Ambiguous Max Plus Three Automata by Eric Paul. And um, so Eric, uh, over, to, uh, over to you for a short, uh, short presentation. Okay, um, you can hear me? Yes. And you can see my monitor, right? Yes. yes. All right. Okay, so uh, in my paper, I prove a decidability result for max plus three automata. Max plus three automaton is a finite automaton that assigns uh, real numbers to trees. Uh, for a run of our automaton, we put a uh, state on every node of the tree we want to read. And such a run gives us a transition for every, uh, every node of the tree. So for example, at this A here, we have this uh, red transition. Our max plus three automaton assigns a real weight or the weight minus infinity to every such transition. And it assigns a final weight to every state. And then the weight of a run takes the sum of the weights of all the transitions in the run plus the final weight at the root. And to each tree, we assign the maximum over all runs on that tree. So that's the uh, basic model. And I want to consider deterministic max plus three automata. And here I use bottom up determinism. So whenever we know the uh, child states of a transition and the uh, transition letter, then there is at most one state we can go to. So with the way that's not minus infinity. Okay, so that's the model we're talking about. And for this model, this automaton, I consider the finite sequentiality problem. And here we ask, given an arbitrary max plus three automaton, is this automaton equivalent to a finite maximum of deterministic max plus three automata? So in the paper, I proved that uh, this um, problem is decidable for finitely ambiguous max plus three automata, so only for a subclass. Um, and here, finitely ambiguous means that uh, we have some constant m such that on every tree, we have at most m valid runs. So this, uh, these runs, which have a weight that is not minus infinity, for every tree, the number of such runs is smaller than this constant m. And so that's the um, basic result of my paper. Right. Uh, thank you very much, Eric, for that uh, succinct and uh, effective uh, presentation. Of course, we have your fuller, your fuller presentation uh, online. Um, that we could uh, we could watch earlier. So um, I was wondering um, I was wondering about um, uh, you know um, upper bounds for um, for your decision procedure in terms of complexity. Uh, is there anything you can say there? Um, actually, no. Um, I didn't really consider complexity. Uh, I was more worried about the decidability itself. Um, the thing is that uh, this becomes pretty much um, very complex. So it's exponential, probably already deciding the criterion I point out here. And uh, even then constructing these automata would probably also be two or three exponential towers. 
And that's uh, so impractical that I didn't really do the math for complexity here. I see. Um, what about the, the problem itself? Are you aware of any interesting um, lower bound, lower complexity bound in the problem? Lower bound? Um, I know that uh, I did the math for, for a simple problem and there or you deciding whether some some simpler criterion is satisfied was already piece by hard. So I know that this is at least piece by hard, but I would assume it's harder. Thank you. Any any other questions uh, for Eric? Do we have any questions on Slack, Florian, uh, or rather David? Uh, no questions on Slack. Uh, I have one more, um, Eric, which is about further work. So, um, so where um, you know what's what's the next uh, what's the next thing to do um, from your point of view? Um, from my point of view, um, so there's these uh, ambiguity subclasses in Max Plus, Max Plus automata, Max Plus three automata, and um, all of the research I'm doing, so this is part of it, um, mostly deals with characterizing these uh, these ambiguity subclasses. So basically here for the finite sequentiality problem, this is probably the, the end of the line because next would be uh, analyzing polynomially ambiguous max plus automata, max plus three automata. And there this problem would probably, um, we would then use this uh, to solve harder problems by um, like uh, showing that some polynomially ambiguous max plus three automaton can be um, expressed as a finitely ambiguous max plus three automaton. And then you can use my result to um, like get a finite sequentiality, the decidability for, for more automata for a larger subclass. And so I, actually plan to do more research on that, so on larger classes of these automata. Okay, interesting. Uh, well, best wishes with that. Um, does, um, does anybody have further questions at this point? In which case, let me thank Eric. And uh, let's see whether the next, uh, the next uh, speaker, um, of for the paper cost automata safe schemes and downward closures is available. Uh, it is um, uh, David Barozzini. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, sorry. I think it's like this. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. So uh, our work is uh, cost automata safe schemes and uh, downward closures. And it's a joint work with uh, Lorenzo Clemente, Thomas Colcombe and uh, Pablo Paris. Uh, this work uh, presents three main, uh, three main results. The first result is a model checking uh, result we show that, um, that uh, the model checking for safe schemes uh, is decidable for against uh, properties definable by alternating B automata. Uh, alternating B automata are, um, is this automaton model. They basically are uh, uh, two-way automata, two-way alternating automata with counters where the counters uh, cannot uh, influence the run. They are only used for um, for the acceptance condition. And um, here the, the proof is based on the, on the fact that we can uh, lower the order of the, of the scheme uh, at the expense of uh, making the automaton, uh, of transforming the automaton from uh, one way to two way. And uh, then we use the fact that uh, for this automata model, one-way automata and two-way automata are equivalent. Uh, 
However, in the in this lowering the order, there is um, we use the fact that uh, the scheme we are uh, working on is uh, safe, and this safety assumption is uh, fundamental in the in our proof. It's uh, it's open whether this assumption can be dropped. The, um, the second um, the second uh, result is about uh, downward closures. Uh, downward closure of a language is uh, the smallest uh, language containing it and uh, closed under uh, homomorphic uh, embedding. Uh, we show that uh, the computability of downward closures for uh, three languages reduces to um, reduces to to an unboundedness problem, that is the diagonal problem. Uh, here. We do this by following the same ideas uh, that are uh, used for the word uh, language case. And uh, uh, yeah, we, we define some, uh, we define the diagonal problem for trees and we show that uh, we can compute, uh, we can compute the word closures of uh, tree language of three languages only if we can um, decide uh, the diagonal problem. And uh, okay, the third uh, and last uh, result is uh, basically a corollary of the first two results. Uh, we note that we can express the diagonal problem by using uh, alternating the automata. And uh, thanks to this, uh, for the, thanks to the first uh, result, we have that um, we can uh, decide the diagonal problem over um, languages of finite trees uh, um, recognized by safe schemes. And uh, thanks to the second result, uh, we have that uh, we can um, compute downward closures for uh, three languages recognized by safe schemes. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's mostly it. Okay, thank you very much, uh, David. That was, uh, that was clear. Um, we, have, uh, we have a question from, uh, from Damian um, that, that, was, uh, that, that came through the Slack. Um, yes, yes, so maybe I, I will state it uh, myself, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, it's fine. Uh, you, you hear me? Uh, hey. Yeah, uh, well, so since it's about uh, this open problem you mentioned uh, uh, to remove uh, safety assumption. Uh, uh, so, so generally I would ask uh, what is your intuition if the, the answer is uh, positive or negative? And in particular, uh, what I wrote in, uh, in Slack. Uh, so we have, we know uh, some uh, examples of, of unsafe, um, uh, uh, trees, yes, so they are quite meaningful, yes, so the first such example was, was proposed uh, by Paweł Urzyczyn and then Paweł Paris uh, used it and uh, some other examples to prove uh, that uh, indeed safety is, is essential, uh, but could you, did you try to at least uh, with these examples if, if, if it can, uh, if, if it works, if, if you, we can decide uh, be, be automata, acceptance of be automata? Okay. Well, the well, the truth is we didn't uh, we didn't really check. <laughs> the The proof is uh, the proof for uh, for the this first result is very um, syntactical, in a way. So um, the the safety assumption is is uh, is used to show that everybody everything that. Uh, Basically, that everything works. That we can uh, we can transform we yeah, can mm -hmm. transform trees in, uh, into other trees. We didn't check um, for particular trees. Mm -hmm. uh, but you remember uh, my my first question: What is your intuition? Uh, because if, if this is positive, so so my, my the second part of my question is not so interesting. But maybe if uh, it can be. Mm, if, uh, if the problem is not decidable, so we could try with, with these particular examples. Mm. Uh, 
Well, my intuition, I think, uh, I think it can be proved that, um, I mean, I think we can do it for, um, for uh, non-safe, uh, non-safe schemes. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's only my intuition. We don't really know one way or the other. We don't really know whether this is true or not. Mm -hmm. Okay, so thank you. Mm. Okay, um, uh, thanks David and, uh, and Damian for your interesting question. Uh, we have another question by Togrul um, that has come through. Togrul, are you there? Yes, I am. So uh, the question was, so you mentioned this paper by, by Lorenzo Clemente, 2016 years old, and it says that um, the, com the download closures are computable for, this was from the video, I think, download, uh, download closures are computable for languages of finite words generated by schemes. Mm, and, yes. And using your result, uh, we can compute downward closures for languages generated three languages but generated by safe schemes hmm. so my question was did it so what sort of complexity do these things have do they compare at all? Mm. we didn't uh, we didn't really looked into into the complexity of um, of um, of the algorithm for uh, for trees, for a downward closure, for safe schemes. Uh, this said, the the algorithm, the algorithms are pretty similar. So I think the the complexity should be more or less the same. I don't. Uh, I I don't really we didn't really check uh, we didn't really study the complexity of this uh, of this problem thank you david i see that uh, lorenzo had um, his uh, hand raised but then he lowered it lorenzo is your hand still raised yes <clears throat> do you hear me yes Okay, so I would like to just add uh, also a comment, a general comment regarding complexity, because in general, computing the word closures allows to solve the emptiness problem because this computation is effective and we get then the finite automaton, which means uh, any lower bound for the emptiness problem we transfer as a lower bound on the size of automata that we get so this probably can answer a wide amount of these kind of questions uh, straight away. So this, this was my comment. Okay, um, uh, thank you. And uh, nice to hear from you as well, Lorenzo. Um, does anybody else have, um, have a question to David? Uh, I, um, I have one um, which, um, which is that um, kind of, Around the start of your paper, you, um, uh, you have some, some motivation for this line of work coming from, uh, from verification. Um, so I was wondering about, you know, how you see your results um, impacting um, actual verification? Hmm. Uh, I... <laughs> I don't really know. Uh, huh. I, I don't really know how to, to answer. I mean, in practice, these, um, uh, these algorithms, these algorithms are pretty, are pretty complex. So I'm not sure they will be uh, that um, you well, I don't think they will be that used in in practice. Uh, okay, thanks, uh, thanks, David. Yeah. Um, anybody, anybody have a uh, anybody has a, a further question or remark? Okay, in which case, let's uh, let's thank um, David again. And uh, so we move to our third paper in the session, 
um, which um, is on computing measures of weak um, MSO definable sets of trees. Uh, and the speaker there uh, is Michal. Michal, are you there? Yes, I am there and I hope that you can hear me well. Uh, and yes. you can see the slides. Uh, the work is joined with uh, Damian Niewinski and Marcin Przybyłko. And uh, as, as you said, we want to compute measures. These are measures that are coined, uh, called coin flipping measures because you label a structure and for every node of the structure, you choose the label randomly with equal probability among all, uh, all labels. Um, the structures we deal with are infinite trees, infinite binary uh, trees. And the formalism, the specification language that we use is a weak fragment of monadic second order logic, which differs from the full MSO logic by this um, fi finite set quantifier. So you can say that there is a finite set of nodes or that every finite set of nodes satisfies something. This is a logic equivalent to the alternation free fragment of uh, model me calculus. So it is a fairly expressive logic. And the problem that we study is that you're given a formula and you want to compute the probability that a randomly generated tree uh, satisfies that formula. And our main result states that it is, in fact, uh, doable. Uh, the probability is always an algebraic number. It might not be rational, but it's always algebraic. Um, and um, as, as possible applications of our result, we indicate model checking for stochastic uh, branching processes. So we work with the branching time realm, and you want to verify uh, some stochastic behavior. And uh, our proof uses some approximations of the language of a given um, weak alternating automaton. So we have a sequence of approximations uh, as sets of trees, and then we lift it to the level of probabilistic distributions uh, over the power set of the set of states of the automaton. And we use a properly uh, chosen order in that domain. And this is called probabilistic power domains. And on top of that, we use some induction on the priorities of the automaton. And in the end, our whole construction reduces the problem to Tarski's uh, theory. And then we can either decide whether the probability is bigger or smaller than some given number, or we can even represent that number as a root of, of some polynomial. And moreover, um, our technique can be adapted to more general measures, not um, only coin flipping measures, but measures generated by some branching processes. So then you get a measure, you get a, a formula, and you um, uh, compute the probability of, uh, of the language of that formula with respect to that measure. And yeah, I think this is all, uh, and the rest is in the paper and in the long presentation. Uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Michal. Um, and indeed, we, uh, we had the longer presentation as well. Um, thank you for this succinct one. Um, does, uh, does anybody have a question? Uh, two participants raised their hands, but um, I'm struggling to see um, who, who they are. Um, uh, Florian, can you help? Lorenzo and Idon. Um, so. Okay, um, uh, maybe um, Edom, Edom, you first. Yeah, hi, can you hear me? Yes. So my question was uh, as follows. Uh, your probability measure is a map from uh, three languages to algebraic numbers. And I wondered uh, whether it's a uh, surjective and uh, if so, whether there's some, it gives you some relation between uh, some complexity notion on the tree language side that can be translated to the height or width of the algebraic number? Mm -hmm. That's a very nice question. And we were interested and we are still interested in that. Uh, there are certain examples of algebraic numbers that you can achieve. And there are some methods of obtaining new numbers, but uh, we don't know whether every algebraic number in the range between zero and one can be achieved uh, that way. Mm, the problem is that when you when you combine probabilities, um, you have somehow limited means. Like you can take a product of two probabilities by taking independent events. You can take a dual coproduct, co uh, but for instance, taking a sum of two probabilities um, is is not obvious, and we don't know how to do that. Thank you. 
thanks, uh, thanks, Mihao and Eden for the uh, nice question. Um, over to you, Lorenzo. Yes, uh, thank you. So first of all, I would like to really express my uh, happiness to to read this paper and the presentation because I really enjoyed uh, the results and also the techniques and uh, I really liked it. And I would like to ask to to Michal, uh, what is the most urgent open problem that is left uh, in this? Oh, so probably I should have mentioned that in this short presentation, the motivating uh, conjecture is that we can compute measures of uh, of full MSO of all regular languages of infinite trees. Um, and I would say that our paper indicates uh, like what is difficult there. Um, we, we deal with these weak languages weak because we have these um, le omega lens sequences of approximations. And in the case of general languages, there are such appro approximations, but their lens is omega one, the first uncountable ordinal. And um, yeah, we hope to be able to deal with that, but at the moment we don't know how. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe I can add uh, just just a remark because uh, well, in the, the longer presentation, uh, you can see what is known also in the paper. Uh, so uh, there are uh, some uh, not weak three languages uh, for which we also can compute. This is what's a result of Michalewski and Mio uh, for the so-called uh, game uh, three languages, which are quite strong, but they are in some sense um, close to deterministic. Uh, so uh, so uh, in comparison to this, the, the, the weak monadic logic, it has um, uh, weakness as far as infinite conditions are, con uh, are uh, considered, um, uh, but it's quite uh, free in non-determinism uh, uh, for, for, for local properties, mm -hmm. it's like this. Okay, thank you, Damian, uh, for that further clarification. Um, um, I suppose there's no notion of um, kind of um, um, not not restricting this discussion to Warsaw. So over to you, uh, Lorenzo, again. <laughs> yes, so I mean, uh, you don't have, yeah, okay, but I will ask, uh, so the question is whether you, the authors have been looking at uh, unambiguous uh, automata to represent trees, or whether this has been studied already, I don't know, and whether this could be a, a step towards the, the, the bigger problem. Mm -hmm. It's again a very nice question. Um, we had this idea because there are known examples in which counting uh, models works with unambiguous uh, automata, mainly because you have a bijection between uh, the accepted structures and the runs. Uh, and it is true for infinite trees, uh, but this bijection uh, definitely does not preserve the measure. And um, we, we have some examples in which um, it seems um, unhelpful. Uh, so it's a totally different question to uh, to compute the measure of the set of accepting runs and uh, the measure of the actual language. And um, I, I would say that my intuition is that here an ambiguity wouldn't help, but I don't know. Thank you again, mm -hmm. Michal. Any further questions? Um, I, I, I have one, uh, uh, which is that um, in your um, theorem two in the paper, you point out um, that um, you have a complexity upper bound polynomial um, in the number doubly exponential in the automaton and singly exponential in the process. Uh, can you comment on you know whether that's optimal in any sense? Uh, mm. I don't know. Uh, so we were happy to 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 state this result and to to have it uh, because it's like a distinguishing between the specification and and like data complexity, where the process can be pretty big and the specification is rather small, and then you combine them and you get a bit better probability, uh, a bit better complexity. Um, but um, I'm, I'm not sure about um, any technique showing that it's um, optimal. We don't know. Maybe Damien, if you have some, uh, some ideas on that, I don't know. Damien? Uh, well, I don't know, this is maybe uh, just, uh, just naive what, what I, I have in mind, but, but already for a non emptiness of alternating weak automata, it is uh, not, it's I think exponential, yes. So, uh, 
So the, we have, we have uh, and so we will ask if uh, so it's, it's, it's probably related. So 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 lower bound, but 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 you are right. We should we should try to to to, to see if there are no not so easy lower bound scheme. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Michal. Thanks. And uh, so we move to um, the fourth paper in the session. Um, I shouldn't have made that remark about Warsaw, right? Um, so it's single use automaton transducers for infinite alphabets and the speaker is Rafael. Are you there, Rafael? I am here. Over to you, Rafael. Okay, so, sorry, mm. can you see my screen? Hello, can you hear yes. me? Yes, yes, everything okay, so, is fine. So the presentation is about, so. so the presentation is about single use automata and transducers for infinite alphabets and it's joint work with Mikolaj Bojancic. And basically we just, took the regular register, re, re, register automata for infinite alphabets and they have registers in which they store some values, some data values and they compare them. And we added this restriction that whenever they, they test whether, for example, this register is equal to this register, the, the register value get erased. But we know that it was false. So basically the, the register are single use now. And, and, and we just studied what's, what's going on with, with those automata. And, and the results is that like once we look at the automata as acceptors of languages, then we have five equivalent models. And two, two of them were, were previously stud, studied and like two of them are just one way single use re register automata and two way single use re register automata. And the fifth one is a, is a variant of regular list functions that adds atoms to it and also, but you can also look at those automata as transducers, so as functions. And then you have four equivalent models. So what, one of them is two-way single-use register transducers, but we also have like a, a Cronrod's cron, cron style decomposition T, theorem. And then again, the regular, re, regular, sorry, regular list functions. And then finally, you have the streaming strings transducers with, with atoms when the single use restriction seems to nicely match with the copulous restriction that was original in the original string string format. So that's, that's our work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rafael. Um, very nice. Um, any questions? Um, David, do we have? Yes, we have a question from Noreen. Um, uh, via Slack, um, Noreen, are you are you on on Zoom as well? No, she's not. No, right. So 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 the question uh, we can see it in the chat, but but I'll uh, I'll read it out for you, Rafael. Um, thank you for the talk. I'm wondering what the rigid restriction of MSO is. Is there more to it than the additional atom equality predicate that you have mentioned? So yes. So that's. There, there's more to it, and, and this is this is because maybe I can write something. This is because can I draw like once we have the unrestricted unrestricted. Sorry. So like once we have this predicate x tilde y, which says that there is the, the same data value on x and and, and y. Then we can, for, for for example, define that the language the first letter appears again, the, the like the data value on the first letter appears appears again. So like in here we have to like every time we have this predicate tilde which checks whether there's the same data value, we have to guard it with some phi, which is x y, and then this phi has to has this property that for each x there is at most one y and for each y there is at most one x that satisfies this property. So that's the rigidly, 
that's the rigid guard. So this is just MSO tilde, and this is the rigidly guarded MSO tilde. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks, Rafael, for that uh, informative answer. Um, any further questions for Rafael? I have one, uh, Rafael, which is um, what about trees? Rather, data trees. So, so, so it's it's kind of hard to to use it directly for 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 trees because here we have the the two-way transducers model, which is the, 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 the interesting one. And, and this somehow corresponds to the tree walking automaton, which is not, 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 not equivalent to, to the general MSO, right? So, so we don't know much about tree stats. That's the answer, maybe I should be like, it's, it seems to be a, a, a little bit more complicated. I see, okay, thanks. Um, any further questions for Rafa? In which case, uh, thank you again, Rafa. And uh, so we um, move to the uh, fifth paper in the session, which is from linear to additive cellul cellular automata. And uh, the presenter is Enrico. Are you there, Enrico? We can see your slides, but can we hear you? Uh, Florian, can we hear Enrico? Uh, Enrico, we still can't hear you. Uh, can you please check out whether you have selected the correct microphone in Zoom? On the bottom left, there's on the microphone icon an up arrow. Uh, arrow where you can select the microphone. Make sure you have selected the correct microphone there. Okay. Right. Now we can hear you. I guess. You hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank now you. It works. Sorry. <laughs> So, um, so my talk is uh, um, concerns uh, cellular automata. I think that uh, all of you know about cellular automata, at least for game of life. And the point that we are uh, trying to understand is, okay, uh, so essentially, basically, a uh, cellular automaton can be seen as a, dimensional or one dimensional structure, a grid, and all automata are arranged on this grid. And I have the ALUCAP table to update the state of all my automata. Uh, the point is that uh, if I try to understand which properties I will see uh, uh, when updating my automata, uh, for example, here I show you one dimensional automaton with, in which the initial configuration is uh, the uh, uppermost one and time goes down. And uh, so I have the lookup table, I see something on, on, my, on my diagrams and I want to uh, forecast properties of these diagrams, okay? And there is a huge result of Yarko Kari which says that any the of my cellular automata is in fact undecidable. So this is a big problem also, for example, in practical applications. And uh, so what we did is to uh, put some structure on the of my automaton and use the structure uh, to uh, forecast properties. And so if what is the result of the paper is that there are many properties which have been studied uh, over the years and we proved the decidability of the properties that you see in yellow boxes here, okay? And uh, in particular in the talk that you have probably seen 
in the in the video i spoke about the sensitivity to initial conditions sensitivity to initial conditions is the classic what is popularly known as the classical butterfly effect if i have two one initial configuration and my system is sensitive then for any initial configuration I can find an arbitrary closed initial configuration for which if i look at the two orbits then the two orbits definitively get far away one from another so if i have an imprecision in the measurement of the initial configuration or an error let's say in the measurement of the initial configuration then this uh, expands forever okay and uh, so we proved that for the case of additive automata this property is decidable and it is not the case for general automata mm, i think that that's all okay um thank you very much um enrico um we have a question uh, a question um from marcus uh that came through slack but uh, marcus you are there as well yes yeah, yeah i'm here i can ask it live please if you can hear me okay uh thanks thanks for a nice talk um i was really interested about this big gun theorem <laughs> uh, I mean, um, so can you explain the high level? What, 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 what's the sort of technical problem there that you need to solve uh, using 25 pages? I think you mentioned in, in the talk. Yes, was it? <laughs> it was a, it was an incredible story, in fact. Um, so the idea is that uh, the following. First, I put the context and then the use. I mean, maybe I have one slide for that. Here it is. Okay. Uh, what is the basic idea? Basic idea is that uh, we don't solve the main problem, but at first we solve a, um, let's say, easier problem, okay? In which uh, we have a cellular um, automata on specific structures. And uh, in fact, they are called Frobenius cellular automata because, uh, in fact, they can uh, their up, uh, lookup table can be represented by a Frobenius matrix. Okay, and uh, we proved another theorem in another paper, which said that, uh, that if uh, this uh, the powers of this matrix are um all different when i take powers 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 i have an infinite number of distinct powers then my system is sensitive to initial conditions okay then uh, we wanted to extend this result to the general case of of of, of uh, linear cell automata and uh, in fact, uh, the idea was to take to reduce the problem of linear cell automata. So those cell automata for which the lookup table can be represented as a matrix, okay, and um, to case of linear uh, CA. And uh, and the idea is that I can I want to compare how the powers of the matrix of a Frobenius CA and the powers of the, my uh, general linear cellular automata evolves. And the big gun theorem says that if the Frobenius, which can be embedded in the, uh, in the um, linear CA has some behavior, for example, an infinite number of distinct powers, then the other linear CA also have. And so we can conclude that the system is sensitive. So it was used for the reduction, in fact. Okay. And yeah, it, yeah. Uh, it is not. 
at first we thought that it was an easy result, but it took us a very long time to find. Maybe but also because we are not hyper expert of algebra, so <laughs> so maybe another prep maybe could have found less time. Great, uh, thank you, Enrico. Um, any any more questions for Enrico? Uh, Marcus, um, over to you again. Yeah, thanks. Um, I was wondering, so you have this sort of Frobenius normal for, form. Are, they, yes. are there other normal forms that are used in the literature? I, I mean, I, I don't know the literature, so I'm just uh, interested so, in this. Okay, in, in, in matrix al algebra, of course, there are other nor normal forms. But for example, Jordan normal form or, and, and other. But uh, here we use normal, uh, the Frobenius normal form because, in fact, the trick is to use the characteristic polynomial and not the full information of the matrix. So exploiting the characteristic polynomial uh, was uh, a kind of a shortcut for us to prove things. And uh, the, the nice fact about uh, Frobenius uh, Matrices is that the, the 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 characteristic polynomial of the matrix can be computed from the last line of the matrix. In fact, the, the coefficient of the polynomial are exactly the, the 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 elements of the last line of the matrix, and so this helped us in a lot of algebra stuff. This was the idea. But um, I, I, I don't know, for example, if other uh, representation can help with more general groups, for example. Okay, thanks. That used here. Okay, thank you again. Um, that clarifies. And thank you, Marcus, for another interesting question. Um, any further questions? Thank you. So, um, so Enrico, um, I suppose you could predict my question, um, which is what about the complexity of your decision procedures? Okay, uh, sorry. Um, in fact, the complexity, um, uh, it, 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 it is polynomial, okay? Because uh, it, can the, 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 character, the characteristic polynomial can be computed in polynomial time. And uh, from that, I can uh, already decide, okay? Just looking at some properties of the characteristic po polynomial. So uh, this is the, inter the interesting part for this matter. Because for example, there are, uh, there is, uh, about the sensitivity to initial conditions, a more general res result, which is very recent by uh, Yarko Kari, and which works for uh, all type of groups, not only for abelian groups, okay? And uh, the point is that uh, in, uh, we tried to understand uh, the com which is the complexity of his construction, and in fact, it is clear that it is exponential, but I don't even know how many towers of exponential are there. In fact, it is not clear if this the a finite number or what. And uh, sorry, a constant number or or, or the, it depends from 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 the automaton. So um, I think that the interest also for for practical applications is this. Uh, polynomial decidability question. Thank you, Enrico. Any further comments or questions? Uh, okay, thanks. You're and welcome. That, uh, that brings us to the last paper in, um, in the session um, on when is a bottom-up deterministic tree translation top-down deterministic and our presenter is Helmut. Are you there, Helmut? Yes, I am. So I try to share my screen. Okay. OK. 
can let's see. Can it? Florian, can you help? So uh, maybe the other screen sharing was enabled until just right now. Um, please try again. Ah, okay, I try. So, can you see my screen? Uh, no, there is no screen sharing enabled. Ah. So the, I only I only see something like uh, uh, maybe I have to do this. I only part. see below the bottom up brechen, but not Thailand. So this sharing is not enabled for me. Uh, maybe you want to stop it and restart it again. I try. So I, I first press this sharing button. So Helmut, I have another suggestion. Given that we are towards the end of our hour. Uh, yeah. would, you, would you mind actually just, you know, um, orally yes. uh, telling we us? Can also, no problem. So our paper is about uh, deterministic tree transducers. Uh, tree transducers typically come into flavors, namely uh, top-down tree transducers and bottom-up tree transducers. And it turns out that those are uh, th those two are incomparable models. But there is an obvious way how a top-down uh, tree transducer can be enhanced to deal uh, to realize a bottom-up translation, namely by equipping it with a uh, look-ahead. And uh, the look-ahead can be considered as you do a pre-processing run of a bottom-up deterministic tree automaton, which then uh, tags each node with uh, the state with the attained state. And so this attained state at every node serves as kind of an advice to the uh, top-down tree transducer. So um, now the question is, now we have a top-down tree transducer with this ugly extra uh, thing, namely this, uh, this look ahead. The question is, is this look ahead necessary or can it be removed? And in general, this, uh, this question has been uh, considered for arbitrary deterministic top-down tree transducers for quite a while and is a hard problem. So we uh, restricted ourselves to top-down tree transducers which are uniform copying. These are those which come, uh, which one obtains when one simulates these uh, bottom-up tree transducers. So the question now, once again, we want to remove the look ahead. And the first step there is uh, to provide an, a particular normal form for the transducers, which is in this case the earliest normal form, where output is produced as quickly as possible. So uh, this is nice, but and there, is a co there are constructions for that around, but they usually uh, destroy the, dedicate, the specific property which we have here. So this uniform copying. So we had to come up with a dedicated earliest normal form. And then additionally, we required to find structural properties of uh, top-down tree transducers with look-ahead so that uh, the look-ahead uh, can be eliminated. These uh, structural properties turn out, so, uh, they seem to be quite uh, efficiently uh, decidable, but in the end, then it comes, uh, then one can do a kind of canonical uh, uh, transform uh, construction, which provides uh, a top-down tree transducer without look-ahead whenever this is possible. Uh, but that one can be rather large. And it has another little uh, tweak that it uh, still requires what we call inspection. So uh, that means for certain uh, parts of the input, uh, which are not visited by the tree transducer, one might want to know whether uh, one might want still want to check whether it is contained in some top-down deterministic language. And so then uh, this brought us to our uh, last and perhaps even technically most involved question, namely, when is this inspection uh, really required and when can it be removed? And it turns out that, uh, that there are some kind of... Uh, something like static analysis for programs, this can be here applied to the tree transducers to find out um, 
what re what kind of inspections are necessary and then allows us to provide provisions so to satisfy these uh, the requirements to uh, to realize the inspections thank you uh, thank you very much uh, helmut and uh, thanks uh, uh, also for adapting uh, very quickly to the technological circumstances um do we do we have uh, questions from uh, for Helmut from Slack, uh, David? Uh, yes, there's one from Aidan. Aidan, uh, over to you then. Uh, hi, thank you. Um, so my question is a little bit tangential. Uh, I apologize for that. Uh, I was wondering whether so it seems like you had two choices. Uh, since this problem is difficult, you could restrict the transducer as you've done, but you could have also restricted the look ahead. Uh, does, the, does this make uh, sense? Is it natural or? Um, I mean, this is a, it's an interesting direction. So we have not done that because we wanted to cover the, the whole class of bottom-up tree transducers. Okay. And it's not clear to us what, are the, what kind of restrictions might be helpful here. But I think we, we simply have not thought about it. And if one gives it a try, one might identify interesting things there. Thank you. OK, thanks. Uh, thanks, Helmut, and thanks, Eden, for that uh, question. Um, any more questions from people? I, I have one, um, Helmut, which uh, may be related to Eden's, uh, which is simply um you know what about uh, dropping the uniform copying uh, restriction so actually uh, at some point if, if one does that uh for some reason we uh, so we we had an earlier attempt where we tried that together with yoast and uh, we kind of uh, got stuck in uh, a variety of uh, technicalities and the, the, the problem is that if you drop that, then the top-down retransducer may uh, at this may transform the same subtree multiple times. And so the state, uh, so an intermediate state, so to speak, of the trans uh, of the transduction, then is that you are in multiple, uh, yeah. In you have to keep track of these multiple processings of uh, uh, multiple processing of the same input, and that seems to be uh, tedious. And so, for things like, for example, pumping or something is difficult because you then have this. Uh, you, you must do simultaneous pumping for many states, and uh, and this is we simply got lost in the technicalities. But but you 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 have a you have a sense that there is a, a kind of a difficult problem behind that or I mean if it's uh, it depends what you mean by difficult problem I mean if you have the right approach then nothing is difficult and uh, so it seems only that our possibilities of expressing things and uh, describing things perhaps is not yet ripe for it but it does not mean I think it is possible. And uh, if only one had the right uh, way to look at it and uh, to the right formalism. OK, thank you, Helmut. Any, any more questions for Helmut? Uh, any comments? OK, thanks again. Thank you. So that actually brings us to the end of our session. And I would like to thank um, Anuj David, Florian, all the speakers and uh, all the participants. Thank you all very much.